Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10. And uh, we're returning back to, to the story in Samuel. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to pray so that the Lord will help us understand his word. Lord, I pray that uh, as we see the great fields that are ready unto harvest, we would ask that you would uh, just take your word and cement it in our hearts and lives. And Lord, that we would uh, learn from you and learn from the history of Israel here. And we would take these lessons to heart uh, that, Lord, that you would change us and that we would take your gospel out into the world. We ask that you would uh, ensure that your word does not return void tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to read uh, the first 16 verses from 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Then Samuel took the flask of oil poured it on his head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? When you go from me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they'll say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about the donkeys and he is anxious for you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on further from there and you will come as far as the oak of Tabor. And there three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread and another carrying a jug of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread which you will accept from their hand. Afterward, you will come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it shall be as soon as you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and a lyre before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. It shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires for God is with you. And you shall go down before me to, Gil to Gilgal and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. Then it happened when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart and all those signs came about on that day. When they came to the hill there, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily so that he prophesied among them. It came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied now with the prophets that the people said to one another, what has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man there said, now who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to, a, to the high place. Now Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, where did you go? And he said, to look for donkeys. When we saw that they could not be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, please tell me what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell him about the matter of the kingdom which Samuel had mentioned. <clears throat> so the title of the sermon tonight is God's Anointed Apostate Ruler. God's Anointed Apostate Ruler. And it's been about three weeks since we've uh, tackled Samuel, so just a little bit of time reminding us what we've covered and the significance really of these first 10 chapters of 1 Samuel for today. We're at the end of the time of Judges, around 1050 BC, and God is about to anoint the king of human desire. If you recall Hannah's song back in chapter two, 
Uh, Hannah exalted God's sovereignty in strengthening his king, and at the same time, extol, there she extols how he brings down those are all who are against him. And if you could think several centuries later, before the birth of the King of Kings, Mary in her song in Luke 146 gives glory to her Savior and shows how God brings down human rulers and governments, and yet he shows mercy to Israel. But before that time, here we are, and the glorious days of Joshua are over, and by the end of Judges, Israel was sadly rebellious and outwardly connected to God. Hannah says in chapter 2, the feeble gird on strength, those who are full hire themselves out for bread. And she goes on to say, those who contend with the Lord will be shattered, and the Lord gives strength to his king. And so in their idolatry, the Israelites considered themselves full. And we saw how Israel openly contended with the Lord. So like much of church-going Christianity in South Africa, religion was mere outward form for Israel, a matter of tradition and expediency with no radical inward transformation. But oh, what a merciful God we serve. Because God, in the midst of the darkness, gave them the prophet Samuel, one who faithfully spoke the word of God, and it was said of him, not one of his words fell to the ground. Oh, we would pray that that would also be said of this pulpit here in Antioch Church. Sadly, Israel, in spite of this bright light and corrupted by their idolatry and the ungodly priesthood of Eli and his sons, they really remained effectively in bondage and in bondage to the Philistines. Have you ever lived in fear of death and constant attack? Well, Israel was facing a major crisis. The Philistines were a major source of fear and consternation. They were like terrorists and gangsters encamped in and around them, picking and choosing on who they would attack. And faithful Samuel uh, had Amazing how God had used Samuel at that, in chapter 7 to deliver them from that one attack. But Samuel was getting old and the threat remained. Within a few years, we see in chapter 8, the people now openly rejected the reign of God and his prophet. And they had cast their fearful eyes and idolatrous eyes at the world around them. And they demanded a king like the nations. And if you remember how they illegally assembled and then they shouted at the faithful prophet of God, we don't want God to reign. We want a king like the nations. And it's no surprise, it is true today as it was true then. A carnal people in crisis always looks for carnal solutions. And so these events in 1 Samuel ought not to be consigned to a bygone age, but in fact they're recorded in the Word of God, the Bible, because they are eternally relevant lessons that we really speak to us today. And so the principles from 1 Samuel apply to us as well. We're also a religious people in a religious nation in a crisis. Some want to hear from Scripture, but mostly our ears are captured by human philosophy that floods the media, and those ideas have breached the levee walls of the church. Our own 14-month Philistine crisis called COVID lockdown is still in and around us, and it has not ended. This is nothing new. Men once built a tower of Babel to make a name for themselves and exalted the power of humanism and human remedies for evil, all that deny what divine grace has done for us. And if you think about it as believers, what has set us apart and made us a peculiar people for God. And so being part of Christ's kingdom ought to mark, ought to mark us out as distinct from the world. Has not the blood of the everlasting covenant forever separated between us and the judgment doomed multitude who go along their way? Does not the presence of the Holy Spirit as a seal upon each one of us Mark us in God's eye. 
as also it should be in the eyes of the world, as not of the world, even as Christ is not of the world. But we have to ask ourselves, have we not also desired to be like the nations? And as we study the great truths of 1 Samuel, we see the example of the desire of God's people as they reject God, and it culminates in them wanting a king like them, the apostate king Saul. And so the church must be warned and we must plead more fervently and preach more urgently in the name of the all-sufficiency of God's Son. Unlike Israel in Saul's, in Saul's day, we should reject the faintest hint of ungodly alliances with the world and rather go on with acknowledged weakness, even if it means we're ostracized or shut down or jailed, and even if it means we're the mockery of the world. And so let us like J Jacob halt upon our thigh that the power of Christ may rest upon us rather than seek for any human pragmatic solutions from the world around us. It's incredible to think that one day that God himself will bring about the appointment of apostate governments over his people. What are the implications of that? How then do we actually obey? Which authority will we choose to live under? Perhaps God, in dealing with the ungodly and fleshly desires of his people, will indeed place them under human tyranny. We see here that he has done it. He has done it before. Is it not his prerogative to do it again? And so God anoints apostate rulers so that his people will hopefully see that despite the apparent attractiveness and glories of the nations, they will see that none of them will lead to salvation, to the safety and to the peace that they really need. Psalm 147 says this, that God does not delight in the strength of a horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. And so we, co we covered that astounding event in chapter nine where the man of God, Samuel, is told by God himself to violate the inclination of his own soul and to grant the desires of an idolatrous people. And so often entrenched and when there's entrenched and repeated carnal desire, the people are permitted to God, by God, to have their own way. And yet God graciously, we saw in Samuel, gave them a warning in chapter 8 of what government under Saul will look like. He said, he will remove your sons and he will appoint them for himself, for his army, and to be his horsemen and some will run before his chariots. They will no longer be servants of God in that sense and no longer free to labor for their own profit. They will be liable at any time to be called upon by their king to engage in war, needless or otherwise, to be pierced through by the arrow and cut asunder by the sword as his fancy may dictate. Also their daughters are to be slaves about his house, to be servants of his servants. In his aggression, he will take their land without compensation. Taxes must be paid, and even the tithe, which God had required for himself, would now be consumed by their king. In other words, in their fleshly choice of a fleshly king, they would find that they had moved themselves from freedom to serve God into the bondage of human tyranny. After Samuel's warning, if there was any voice of repentance on that day, if you remember, it was drowned out by the cry of the people in Samuel uh, chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 19. If you look at your, your text there, what did they say? No, but there shall be a king over us, verse 20, that we also me, may be like all the nations. And you know the history. God's warning was proven time and time again in the successive kings of Israel. 
Even David, think about it, even David exemplified the arbitrary nature of absolute power and became a royal murderer against whom no hand could be lifted in vengeance. Solomon oppressed Asa. Ahab was the robber and the killer. The only restraint was God's word through the prophets. The world expects kings and governors to be tyrants and delights in having them. Governments are appointed by God and they are the powers that must be. The fault is not in the power, but in the abuse and the misuse of that power for purposes that are not granted by God. And 1 Samuel is a critical episode in God's plan of redemption in that it is his will for a king, the true king. There will be one who will come, who will reign in righteousness, and that is Jesus Christ. And when he comes, whose right it is to rule, the government will be on his, soul, on his shoulders and oppression and tyranny will cease. The meek shall be judged and the oppressed rescued as we see in Psalm 72. But here now in 1 Samuel begins the first king, a king that looks like them. They had rejected God's reign over them. And so in chapter nine, if you recall in the last sermon, God placed at their disposal all his omnipotence, all his omniscience to providentially guide their selection of a king after their own heart, a king who will meet their desires. This kind of government would not be the kind of king God would select. And so God is choosing for them a king like the people. It would have been impossible for them to actually do this. And so God sovereignly ensures that the result is exactly what they would have done had they been able. And so Saul is the epitome of men according to external human criteria. And if he does not su succeed, if Saul does not succeed, the blame can never be laid upon God. If the king of their choice shows his corruption and his enmity towards God and his alienation from God, it will not be because of the circumstances in which he is placed, but in spite of them. God asked elsewhere, what could I have done more for my vineyard that I have not already done? All has been done. And then as we saw last time, as chapter nine closed, we ended up in the city of Ramah, Saul city, and one evening three men meet and the course of the history of a nation and the world changes forever. And Saul said to his servant, and a stranger they called as a seer, they said they met him that day in Ramah. And Samuel, forewarned by God, told Saul that he was also going to proclaim the word of God to Saul. And so as we ended last time, Saul trying to sleep that very night must have realized he was not just involved in the mundane events of everyday farm life, but now he was dealing directly with the living God. And so chapter 10 opens where chapter nine ended. It's daybreak, Samuel and Saul are on their own on the quiet, dusty road going through the fields near Ramah. The servant was sent on, there are no other human witnesses to what is about to happen. God's anointed apostate ruler is the title. But before Saul is publicly made king, God has three opening scenes here in 1 Samuel chapter 10. So if you're taking notes, the first scene is called the choosing, verse one. The second scene is the confirmation, verses two to six. And the third scene is the contradiction in verses seven to 14. So scene one, the choosing, a private anointing. It says Saul took the flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? Now just a quick explanation there, NASB and the ESV in chapter 10, the translations are slightly different. And the reason is that the NASB follows the Hebrew manuscripts and the ESV actually follows the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, which came later. 
And so the ESV and NASB say, they both say, then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you? And then there's an additional comment in the ESV which says this, to be prince over his people Israel. And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and you shall save them from the, from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you. And then the ESV and the NASB end the same way and say to be a prince over his heritage or his inheritance. So some commentators favor the Greek Septuagint, which the ESV is based on, but I don't think their arguments are very compelling. And what's more important is there not, there's not much at stake here at all in terms of meaning or any changes of any doctrine. And so we're just going to follow the NASB for verse 1 here. And so we see that Samuel does three things towards Saul in chapter 10, verse 1. He pours oil over Saul's head, he kisses Saul, and he speaks to Saul, and he says, it is not him, but it is Yahweh that has anointed Saul, a ruler of his inheritance or his heritage. And so anointings appear to play a prominent role in Israel's history. Both the priests, beginning with Aaron, and prophets always played a role in the anointing ritual. And here in 1 Samuel 10, Saul is anointed. But unlike the false teaching about anointing today, there is no special magic in the oil or even in the ceremony. It's simply that the anointing symbolically signified that the person has been set apart for a special office. Notice there's no comment here made about whether or not the man is saved. It just simply says he was chosen, ready to perform a special task in Israel as required by God. Notice that Samuel sees the anointing as the Lord's anointing, since Samuel was faithfully following the Lord's command. The most significant thing about this anointing here in Scripture is that this is the first time a man is to be anointed prince or ruler, right? The word king is not used here. Later, other rulers would be anointed. There would be David and Solomon and Jehu and Joash. And so the anointing oil is also symbolic throughout Scripture of the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was usually a case of temp temporary empowerment, not only for the priests, but for the judges, for craftsmen, for prophets, and for civil leaders. Usually the job that the person was going to undertake involved a major task or occupation, and it required really unusual abilities uh, above what was normal for the people that were involved. And so verse one then is the private symbolic anointing of Saul and then in verses 9 and 10, you see that this anointing is directly linked with the event of the spirits empowering Saul to be prince or king-elect over God's heritage, God's inheritance, that is the people of Israel. And I would think that the private nature of this event is that God was mercifully teaching Saul something. Saul, who had no background in rulership, that the only power in which it was possible for Saul to carry out this massive task of kingship was in the power of God. And by Yahweh, Saul would rule, and therefore Saul had every opportunity to rule for God in total dependence on him and with, with an eye to God's glory and not his own. In addition, notice the term in verse 1, it talks about a heritage or an inheritance. And that means an indisputable possession, which cannot be transferred to another. And Saul was to recognize that though he was king-elect, Yahweh was not surrendering his claim to his own people. Certainly not to a king like the nations. And so Israel was apostate, her idolatry was deep, and some hard for painful lessons were coming up. And yet God in his loving kindness had not forsaken his people. God remained true to his covenant with his people. And God uses his sovereign providential power to set up the monarchy in Israel 
for the first time. <clears throat> a king, not according to God's desires, but a king according to the nations and the desires of a people looking for deliverance from fear and looking for respectability from among the nations. And so Samuel kisses Saul, and this is a sign of allegiance and subordination to Saul. And then through this action, really Samuel pledges, uh, pledges his allegiance to this king. But as this relationship develops, as you'll see in the coming chapters, note that God's intention is that the authority of the king can never override the authority of the word of God through Samuel. And so the prophet pays homage, but never at the expense of the ultimate king or the word of God. And so this is a reminder, uh, God's word to the nations, to kings and judges as well. It reminds us really of Psalm 2, if you think about it. Psalm 2 verse 10 says this, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he, may not, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so all nations, all kings, all judges are appointed by God to, to be under his authority and nevertheless still commanded to worship Yahweh and kiss the son as Samuel kissed Saul. Do homage to the son. And so God has anointed Jesus and therefore all must and will do homage to him. Those who do not will eternally perish. And so we tend to lose sight of that sometimes in the, in the sense when there's a crisis, because there's a crisis in Israel. And even in our current lockdown crisis, what do we do? We undiscerningly and unconditionally kiss the soul administrators that rule over us. But we forget the church. Allegiance and homage to the king of kings supersedes that of earthly rulers. And Samuel, you'll see, will epitomize that in 1 Samuel. Now, after this private ceremony, which is only known to God, to Samuel, and to Saul, the king-elect has been chosen, and Saul is the ruler over God's heritage. And Saul now is ready to be sent on his way. God's word was spoken, and the choosing is complete. But what a week for Saul. Saul, the tall and handsome and well-to-do farm lad, came asking for mules and left anointed as a monarch. Be careful next time you lose your dog, okay? All right? You never know what's going to happen. God then gives Saul some unusual confirmation signs through the next, in the next section. There are two men at a tomb, three men at a tree, and then a group of men at a high place. Three mysterious events, and each one of these events actually has a message for the king-elect, for Saul. And so we get to our second scene here, uh, scene two, and we call this the confirmation, the confirmation, verses two to six. So let's look at the text. Samuel speaking here, verse two. When you go from me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they'll say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about the donkeys and he's anxious for you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you'll go further from there and you will come as far as the Oak of Tabor. And there three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, the other carrying three loaves of bread and another carrying a jug of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from their hand. Afterward, you will come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it shall be as soon as you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp and tambourine, flute and a lyre before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you will prophesy with them and be changed into another man. Notice in verses 2 to 6, these, these signs then are very detailed. 
and they teach a lesson to Saul in the symbols that they represent. Sign one is in verse two, Rachel's tomb. The first sign will happen when Saul arrives at Rachel's tomb. There will be two men and they will tell Saul that Kish is not worried about the donkeys, but he's much more worried about his son. But why Rachel's tomb? Why Rachel's tomb? You know, yesterday, Gigi and I drove up to Fort Trekker Huchte, uh, and we visited the military grave site of where her father is, was buried. He was a major in the South African Air Force, and he tragically died with uh, 11 other pilots in an air accident in the 70s. And so he was part of this group of 11 pilots who were flying jets for the upcoming 10th Republic Day fly past in Cape Town when the jets, after taking a turn into low, low cloud, crashed into Table Mountain in 1971. I think standing there looking at the grave and the graves of the other pilots, more than ever before, I was reminded of my own frail mortality. Rachel's tomb remain, reminds Saul of his mortality. Rachel died at childbirth with the birth of Benjamin. Now, centuries later, a man of Benjamin is the designated king of Israel. And Saul the king must be mindful of his limitations and his dependency on God. And at this tomb also then Saul hears that the donkeys are found. And so in another lesson, Saul needs to, needs to realize that all his man-made efforts were futile. God was directing all events, even mundane events, in the loss of the donkeys and their recovery and God will always providentially, is always providentially in control and Saul is always dependent on God. And so as king, he must continue to see this dependency on God. And so also Saul learns there that Kish now is anxious for him. And so he's reminded that he is the object of human love. And so if Saul is the object of human love, how much more the love of God for Saul and for his people. And so Saul ought to love God's people the way God loves them. And no matter what vocation God calls you and I to, whether a great responsibility like a king or a government or a lesser responsibility, we are no less under God and dependent and answerable to him. And we too are objects of human love Often this love is expressed in families, but that love can be imperfect. But there's an even greater and perfect love, the love of God that finds its perfect definition and display in the cross of Jesus Christ, a love that God in Christ pours out on his children. And so that's the first sign. Sign two, verses three to four, the oak of Tabor. There were three men at a tree the tree was likely to be quite near Bethel, obviously a large roadside oak tree, well known in that day. And in the Old Testament, oak trees are often mentioned in connection with holy places and religious activities. And the three men, notice in the text, it says they were going up. And so that terminology indicates that they were going up to Bethel to worship and they were bringing sacrifices for that purpose. And so the men were carrying items for sacrifice. Three young goats, which reminds us of a sin offering. Three bre uh, bread loaves, which speak of a wave offering. And a jug of wine, which was for the drink offering. As God then opened more revelation, as we go through our Bibles, we know that these Old Testament sacrifices were prefiguring a coming king, a great king. Jesus Christ, whose body would be broken for our sin, whose life would be poured out on our behalf, once for all, never again to be repeated. And Saul would not know the fullness of those details, but Saul understood blood sacrifice and the need for the remission of sins and the privilege of fellowship with God. And notice in the text that God moves these men to grant Saul two loaves of bread, and Saul is to know that God is the spiritual food of his people and the supplier of physical needs. God is the only one who provides atonement for sin. And now we know that fully, that the bread of life is Jesus Christ. 
And pressing on further, then Saul comes to the hill of God, or Gibeath Elohim. And here occurs the third sign. And so the third sign, verses 5 and 6, is the company of prophets. But this sign is unlike any of the other signs in that the author here in 1 Samuel actually gives us a lot more details of the event. And so Gibeah was about five miles north of, five kilometers north of Jerusalem. And as it rose up in the surrounding plain from the location of Gibeah, you can actually see the Dead Sea in the southeast. And there's a commanding view of Jerusalem in the south. But notice in the text that Samuel refers to a fortress or a garrison of Philistines that were stationed there as well. And so in the very place where the prophets would speak the word of God, the Israelites are conscious that the enemy dwells among them in fortified places and can at any time mount mount attacks against them and then retreat back into the fortress. This would be an indication by God of what Saul would be empowered to do. And so the groups of prophets, they carried musical instruments and they were playing as they sang and as the text says, they were prophesying. And Samuel says to Saul uh, in verse six, he says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. And so then verses nine and 10, the actual event is described. Then it happened. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God changed his heart, and all those signs came about on that day. When they came to the hill there, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily, so that he prophesied among them. So then this entire meeting of the prophets was not only to confirm God's word through Samuel, but it was also the occasion when Saul was empowered by the Holy Spirit and changed for the purpose of carrying out the tasks of being king. As mentioned, I mentioned earlier, this change made in Saul was not intended to be permanent, but for a specific purpose. Later in chapter 16, we will see how the Spirit left Saul, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. Remember Balaam, was also empowered by the Holy Spirit to be God's messenger. And so Saul's kingship still lay in the near future, but this was a reassurance to him as to what God can do through him. And then just as an aside, in case some of you may be confused, salvation in the Old Testament and salvation in the New Testament is exactly the same. All stand condemned. By the grace of God alone, according to his sovereign purposes, a person through no merit of his own may be saved. The righteousness of Christ is applied to all those who are his. In New Testament times, however, at the the Pentecost, at Pentecost, the church was born and the work of the Holy Spirit then had a clear distinction from his work in the Old Testament. In the New Testament is one of conviction, regeneration, indwelling, sealing, and permanent filling. And so empowerment by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, like Saul experienced and others experienced, cannot be equated with salvation. Rather, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's still supernatural, but it enabled unusual skill and confidence for a particular God-initiated task. But when Old Testament saints experienced regeneration and spiritual renewal, they were saved, just like we're saved in the New Testament. Not fully knowing the identity of the God-man Christ Jesus, they were very much people of faith. And through their, though their faith was not expressed in the fullness of the understanding of the cross and resurrection of the God-man Jesus, it was still expressed as faith in God as their redeemer. And to express this God-given faith by grace alone, the Old Testament saint must have been regenerated and sealed, and he would have persevered to the end, exercising faith in God and his redemption, which was gifted to them. Just read about the Old Testament heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. Remember Job? Job says he knows, he knows his redeemer lives. And so God calls them righteous. And so he credits them with righteousness by grace through faith. Now in the fullness of 
the special revelation of God's word, the truths of the same great grace salvation are more fully explained in the New Testament. And I recommend you study this. You can, there's a book by Leon Wood called The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So study the action of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And so just to clarify, here we see Saul prophesying. And there's no indication in the text that this was some frenzy, frenzied, mind-emptying kind of ecstatic experience for Saul. Prophets received direct, a direct word from God, and it was a sensible, understandable word. And so to prophesy was to speak for God. It was supernatural revelation, but it was not frenzied. Remember Samuel as a boy? He heard truth from God directly, and God initiated all those rational occurrences. And in addition, if you study your Old Testament very well, you'll see that musical instruments were not used to generate senseless, crazy, uncontrolled, man-centered, ecstatic, and irrational experiences. Israel's joy, praise, and worship came from knowing God and being in a living and covenantal relationship with him. And so verse 6 says that Saul was changed. Clearly then, in the context, Saul was changed to fulfill his role as king. And this change was verified when he joined the band of prophets in singing and praising God. Now for Saul, this was a an out-of-character willingness to be joining the prophets and their worshipful singing. And it supplied the evidence that he had been empowered for his job as king. In verse 11, Saul's unusual praising God drew the attention of those who knew him in Gibeah. And he was known there in Gibeah. And they were asking, what has happened to the son of Kish? And so God, through this experience, would have that Saul would be reminded that mere knowledge of God was never to be separated from that priestly worship and joy, which cannot be manufactured, manufactured, but flows from a heart that is acquainted with the grace of God, which alone can empower for true service and testimony. Note that all these three signs then were designed to work on the heart and the mind of Saul, so that there, if there were indeed any life towards God, which alone can empower for true service and testimony, it would then be born in Saul. Saul was in these three signs then, he was afforded every opportunity for spiritual renewal. But as the story develops, you will see how his heart, how Saul's heart remains indifferent to God. And so Saul is taught in these three signs and in all events that will occur to him as king, the fact that nothing of man's will and nature can glory before God. Everything was designed, as it were, to call Saul to judge and to refuse himself. So in having no confidence in himself, he may be spared the terrible experiences which you will see in his later history. So what about you here today? Is it mere intellectual knowledge of God that you have? How many opportunities have you had before God and you have had to ask him to remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh? You know God enables you to do your daily tasks. You do them well. But is your confidence firmly placed in yourself and your abilities? Or is your confidence firmly placed in the cross and Jesus Christ? Is your middle name Saul? Or is your heart softened by Christ? Is it captured by the cross? Is it horrified by your sin and the sure prospect of hell? One preacher said, life is short, death is sure, judgment is coming, heaven is glorious, hell is dreadful, and Jesus is savior. May Saul not be your model a king after the pattern of the nations. Rather, as you read this story and you hear more and more about Saul, I would exhort you to place, place no confidence in the flesh and repent and receive Christ. And so in verses 10 to 13, we look at our text. All takes place as Samuel had predicted, and Saul seems to fully come under the control of the prophetic spirit. And when this happened, many were surprised. Note verse 11, the people said to one another, what has happened to the son of Kish? 
Is Saul among the prophets? And in verse 12, a man there said, now who is their father? But sadly, later, in later times, those words became more of a mockery. As they repeated the question years later, after the demise of Saul under different circumstances, this proverb emerged for someone who acted contrary to his character. Verse 12b, is Saul also among the prophets? We might say today, can a leopard change his spots? Saul had evidently not been characterized up to that time by any fear of God or by any faith in him. It was a matter of astonishment that he should thus take his place with these prophets. But sadly, the place he took with these prophets, we know that it was temporary. And so we see the choosing in verse 2, the confirmation with those three signs. And finally, in scene 3, the contradiction, the contradiction. Verses 7 to 16. So Saul, like many religious unbelievers from the beginning, is somewhat of a spiritual contradiction. He seems to intellectually acknowledge God and Samuel, but his actions, even at the beginning, right here in the beginning, hint at an apostate heart, like people, like ruler. In the final instructions of Samuel, back in verse 7, Samuel tells Saul that when these signs come to you, Saul, you must do for yourself what the occasion requires, for God is with you. Then in verse 8, Saul is to go to Gilgal and to wait for Samuel there. Now, some would hold that the implication of verse 7 was that Saul, after being empowered by God, that the occasion that Samuel was referring to was to attack the Philistine garrison stationed there at Gibeah. And then Saul was to go down to Gilgal and wait seven days for Samuel there. Instead, after his encounter with the company of prophets, verses 14 to 16, give us a curious encounter of Saul with his uncle. And there is much debate as to whether Saul obeyed Samuel's two instructions or not. If verse 7 meant that Saul was to attack the Philistine garrison, he did not. Also, it seems that he went home and he met his uncle and he did not go to Gilgal. So even though Saul was empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a skillful king, it did not appear to give him a heart to obey God. So Saul instead meets his uncle and his uncle asks him where he went. Verse 14. Now Saul, Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, where did you go? And he said to look for the donkeys. When we saw that they could not be found, we, we went to Samuel. Saul only mentions Samuel in the context for the search for the donkeys. And when the uncle asked what Samuel said, Saul reports that Samuel told him, what? That the donkeys had been found. And then note what the text says. But he did not tell him about the matter of the kingdom which Samuel has mentioned. I think you can see what is significant here is what Saul did not talk about as opposed to what he did talk about. And so the prince to be the king elect kept his new kingdom secret and he kept it longer. And it's going to take Samuel to make this public. Now, it may appear to some that Saul was a humble man. Perhaps he was timid. There's a possibility that Samuel told him to wait until his public choosing. We're not directly told. But we are shown that this king-elect is certainly going to be somewhat of a spiritual enigma. A man with a lukewarm heart towards God, the things of God. He never openly confesses anywhere what God had said and had already done. But later in Samuel, we'll see the contrast with David. And David, in the face of mighty opposition, openly confesses before men that Yahweh is God most high. And from the beginning... Saul provides to us the importance and the necessity of a faith that obeys God's word and openly confesses him as Lord. You know, our good works are never the cause of our salvation, but works are a necessary consequence of true and saving faith. 
Remember what Jesus said? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And this implies that a person whom Jesus has saved inevitably will seek to do God's will. And if you remember that text there, some of Jesus' hearers objected to this. And they used the very argument that Saul's going to use. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? You're going to see that repeated in Saul's life. And then what did Jesus reply? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The evidence of salvation is not given by dramatic religious experiences. The evidence of salvation is not even present in the great deeds of men, especially where there are no signs of repentance from a life of sin. As we shall see, Saul went on to be a mighty king, a mighty human king, God's anointed apostate, an enigma with many contradictions. And as we conclude this evening, we look at the reality that Saul's experience perfectly fits those who call themselves believers and yet they are steeped in the world and full of worldly attitudes towards God and even towards salvation. From the beginning, Saul typified the kind of person that has profound spiritual experiences yet has little interest in cultivating a true and vital faith with the living God. God's anointed Saul, but it was an apostate government. Since the people in fear and idolatry rejected God, and so God uses all his power to ensure that they would get exactly what they demanded. Saul was the Messiah. Anointed means Messiah. He was the Messiah with a small m. And chosen a king, a king that was exactly tailored for human independence from God. And through the decades of many bitter experiences that are about to follow for Israel, many among God's people will finally cry out for a true king who does God's will and not the will of the world. And God is the covenant-keeping God, and he is faithful. And so God would provide for them a king and a Messiah, finally, after many human rulers, local and foreign, and his coming would be in stark contrast to everything that the world can offer. But Saul was to be the first king. Saul was to be the first king. And then all through the reign of Saul, as we, as we enter into this text of 1 Samuel, you'll see that he stumbles over God's commands. He's finding his own will more suitable to following God's commands. Remember what Jesus the king said? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Saul had a fleeting empowerment from God's spirit, but Jesus, as God's true son, was fully and constantly animated by the spirit of God. And so, friends, tonight, you have a choice between Saul, whose name identifies him as a representative of all the unbelieving world who asks for. Jesus Christ, whose name means that he is the Savior, and his name identifies him as all that God provides for. Only Jesus can deliver people from the penalty and the power of their sins. And so your choice is to embrace the world or trust in Christ, and that will determine the kingdom in which you reside. Either that of the temporary fleshly kingdom trapped in idolatry or fear and humanism or the kingdom of holiness, righteousness and peace and then you will be truly free, freely to serve God. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, as we start with this introduction to King Saul, help us to keep this context in our minds and I pray for any person here tonight. Lord, if they recognize their desire to be independent of you like Saul and how even the experiences that Saul had, as time went by, it was confirmed to the readers that he did not know you. 
that he was not saved, that he had not granted his life to you and dedicated his heart to you, as we see in the life of David. And so I pray for any person here today, if they recognize that, that this would be the day of their salvation, they would truly repent and receive you as Lord and King, as sovereign over every aspect of their life. They would repent and follow you. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.